So hello everyone, thank you for joining us uh, for our panel here on data curation, ethics and governance. Um, before we begin, just wanted to note quickly that this session is being recorded um, and we will be potentially using it for publishing on our website. Uh, please modify your name or shut off your video if uh, you would not like to be recorded. Um, and we'll ask that you keep your audio off, but chat full of questions uh, that we'll ask at the end of the session. So with that, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Drs. Alexandra Kalinkina, uh, Elena Naumova, and Eileen Kennedy to discuss our topic for today. I uh, will begin with a presentation by uh, Dr. Kalinkina, uh, who is a researcher and public health professional. She has worked in e-health towards interconnected and interoperable data systems that support patient-centered care in various countries for the past five years. Uh, Alexandra currently coordinates a digital health project, introducing a tablet-based clinical decision support system into nearly 100 primary health facilities that involves a large multidisciplinary team of software developers, clinicians, researchers, and field staff working in Switzerland, Rwanda, and Tanzania. So please join me in welcoming Alexandra. Good afternoon, everybody. So I will try to share my screen now. All good? All good. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Ryan, for the introduction. Um, so I have been working um, in Tanzania, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Malawi for the last five years or so, and um, Ghana previously to that. Um, and I've been working with health data quite a bit that are generated in these settings. So I'll be um, talking to you a bit today about what it takes um, to generate these data. So I think since you're all in the session, you will all agree that data are important. Um, they're important for governments, for decision making, and also for researchers for assessing trends in um, global health data. So um, with the recent you know, explosion of digital health and um, other various data sources, there are many opportunities for machine learning, for data science, um, for very sophisticated dashboarding tools um, that allow us to see um, to have better insights into the data, but um, underneath it all, um, data quality um, is the underpinning um, factor that really allows us to benefit from these, um, these technologies. Um, so this is an example of a DHIS2 software. Maybe some of you have used the data from this, um, this platform. Um, it's, it stands for District Health um, Information System. And it's used by, by now by most African countries to collect, gather, and um, visualize aggregated, um, aggregated health data. So if you have used um, data from this platform, when you extract them, they look um, roughly like this. So if we want to look at a particular health condition, let's say typhoid, typhoid fever cases by month um, and by districts, you might see a data set that's very simple like this. And you might see that um, a certain potential data quality problem or reporting problem for district B, but the, the cases are very low. Um, the most granular data that you can extract from the system is by health facility. Um, so if you do that, which is highly recommended that you would, um, you might see that the reporting in the system is sometimes um, not very good. So you can see that District B, um, only one health facility has reported, and that's why the cases are so low. And even in District A, one health facility only reports sporadically, whereas the other two um, report pretty regularly. Um, so what I'd like to do is to take you back to the health facility where this data comes from so that you can understand um, what causes some of these reporting challenges. Um, so here you can see quite a typical um, health facility. Um, it's one of the health centers where we work in Rwanda. Um, they're usually busy. Um, they're understaffed, almost certainly, and health workers are performing many different functions. Um, patients are seen quickly. Um, they are um, sometimes underskilled because it's very difficult to get um, good health workers to go to remote locations and to stay there. Um, they have common stockouts because of transportation challenges. Um, clinician turnover is high. Um, so that's kind of the environment where these data are generated. 
Um, furthermore, apart from the clinical duties that these clinicians have, their reporting burden is also very high. Um, so this is a very typical situation. Um, clinicians are working with many, many paper tools um, on their desk while seeing the patients. Um, they might have to write in a patient booklet that the patients take home with them to have some clinical notes. Um, they might also have a record, um, a medical record that stays in the health facility. All of these are typically handwritten. Um, and there are a number of guidelines that they might have to consult if they're uncertain about how to diagnose or um, treat a patient. But um, back to the DHIS2, um, this is the main tool that underpins that reporting system. It's this um, health facility register. Um, so if, even though it's quite difficult to see, there are columns for um, things like patient demographics, um, their name, age, um, sex, and then again, handwritten primary complaints, um, some kind of diagnosis and medications that they were prescribed. Um, so at the end of the month, um, these data, handwritten data from these registers have to be um, tallied and reported in a form like this. Um, it's extremely cumbersome and very difficult to do. So each diagnosis and this form actually goes on. And this is also a real form um, that is filled. Um, it's one of the forms that I helped fill <laughs> have to be reported and they have to be disaggregated by age and by sex. So they have to go through each line of their health facility register and then put a tally mark into the, the cell where it belongs and then tally them all and report them in a form like this. Um, of course, all of these diagnoses, they are reportable, but um, the way to diagnose them Sometimes the health workers have, and sometimes they don't have. Um, so the example that I gave, like for instance, typhoid fever, um, it's most common that the health facility doesn't actually have a lab test to diagnose this, but it's just a common, um, common diagnosis that they tend to use um, when patients present with a certain set of symptoms, because that's the acceptable diagnosis that the patient expects. Um, and you will see that only a few of these um, the clinicians have their diagnoses that they know, and they stick to them for the most part, and the rest of the reporting form is blank. And when you consider just this list, the majority of things they write are actually, they don't fall in these categories, so they become other. <laughs> so that's the most common category that you will get. So the utility of this form um, is quite questionable. So um, at the end of the month, all of these forms and all the health facilities have to be collected. Um, which whether it's dry season or wet season, um, it's not always easy to do. And once they're collected, um, and just to remind us that this isn't one form that the health facility is responsible to do, this is just the outpatient register and the outpatient form, but there are many registers in the health facility in many forms. So in a common place, there can be between seven and 15 forms that are collected from each health facility and at the district level, they have to look inside the cells of all of these different forms and enter them all into the system, which is another, as you can imagine, another place for, um, where error can very easily occur. <laughs> so the end product that we have is this um, aggregated data that can be visualized. It's all, all fine, but the um, leaving aside all those issues and the reporting challenges, um, these indicators are fixed. So if you ever want to change something, um, it adds another, another indicator and it makes the comparability across time very difficult. Um, the categories, aggregation categories are also fixed. Um, so you don't have the ability to change the age breakdown, for instance, because that goes back to the reporting form. Um, there's, as you saw, a lot of missing data. Data are imprecise because of these reasons of um, clinical skills can be poor, there are stockouts, lack of diagnostic um, capacity, and it generates a lot of paper um, all, all over. In a best case scenario, it can look like this. <laughs> In a worst case scenario, it can look like this. <laughs> and this is also a picture that I took myself. <laughs> 
So what is the answer to this problem? Um, in theory, a lot of um, African countries actually right now, they're um, deploying electronic medical records, um, which are quite useful. Um, they are superior to the paper-based system um, by reducing the paper that's used. Um, there is individual level data that's maintained. Um, the clinician has access or they continue to generate patient history that they can look back on when the patient comes again. Um, that doesn't need to be retrieved in this kind of room. <laughs> um, it's right there at their fingertips. Um, it can, in theory, standardize the data collection and also auto aggregation can be possible, saving clinicians a lot of time at the end of the month. Um, and there's also some capability for limited decision support. So if they enter a value that's high, for example, then um, it, they can get a warning message that it's either an error or the patient needs a referral or a special kind of um, treatment. But in practice, um, what sometimes these systems look like when they're not um, designed with a lot of um, a lot of foresight, fores forethought, um, these are the, um, the hypothesis of standardized data collection doesn't always materialize. Um, so here you can see from the physical exam, um, you, these, this is a standard um, way of collecting this data, but it's cumbersome because you have to tick every single, instead of just ticking one thing that applies, you have to tick each one to create the standardized data that, is, that this um, is intended for. But when it comes to chief complaints, um, patient history, all of these are um, free text fields that actually cannot be um, analyzed. And the same with the diagnosis in this particular system. Um, even though it has a drop-down menu, clinicians often type what, they, what is on their mind. They don't look through the drop-down menu. And the system stores what they type, so not enforcing any kind of spelling consistency or um, coding of the diagnoses. So at the end of the day, actually, the, even with these systems in place, the reporting burden for the clinicians doesn't go away because the government cannot get the same data that they're used to in the DHIS2 system. Um, so they put the system in place and in parallel, they keep the paper, uh, paper system. That's normally what happens. Um, so the last um, part that I wanted to talk about is um, an alternative also to the electronic medical record. And this is a type of project that I work on. It's a digital clinical decision support. Um, it maintains all the advantages of the EMR, um, but it also provides comprehensive decision support. So the objective of the system isn't to generate um, a report or um, patient level data, but it is to improve um, clinical care. So, and um, just to, to show you a bit, um, what has to happen in order to make use of this tool is um, we synthesize all the clinical guidelines that used to be on the clinician's de desk in a narrative format. So you have to find the right page and the right place to look up what you are interested in. Um, they're converted to decision trees, and then they're programmed in a software that where by default, um, the nature of the software is that the data have to be coded because the decision tree cannot um, progress with free text data. So there's no free text data and all the data are standard. Um, and these have been used in um, several research studies and they do improve adherence to guidelines and um, the quality of care. Um, but they're not... Um, they're not foolproof um, because it also, it still depends on all of these symptoms like chest and drying, for example, before you can um, select yes or no, you have to be able to recognize it. So clinical skills are still extremely important. Um, so the, the quality of how, what diagnosis you're able to reach at the end of the system depends on your inputs and the quality of your clinical skills to select the right inputs. Um, so. This is not the silver bullet by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it helps. <laughs> and this is just an overview of, um, so on that premise of this clinical decision support, what my team has been doing is actually developing a new software to make the deployment and use of these um, clinical decision support algorithms more, um, more straightforward and easier on a um, large scale. Um, I think this is okay for now. Um, if you want to know anything more, there's a link to our study where you can um, get more information. 
Wonderful. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, and I think now we'll transition over to introducing Dr. Elena Naumova, uh, who is professor and chair of the Nutrition, Epidemiology, and Data Science Division at the Friedman School uh, at Tufts University. Her research focuses on impacts of natural disasters, climate change, and extreme weather on health and nutrition of public, uh, public vulnerable populations. Uh, she is a elected a member of the International Statistical Institute and served on scientific panels for national and international government agencies. She is also editor in chief of the Journal of Public Health Policy and an advisory board member of the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. So Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Should I share my slides? What would be the best? Sure, feel free. I'll do the slides as well. And I want to make it visible to all. It works. Can you see? Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the oops. It seems to me now it's not right, correct? No. <laughs> and um, perfect. So wonderful. Um, what I was really trying to, you know, convey in, in these conversations, and so I remember very well what Sasha was presenting: uh, the paperwork, the storage facilities for the records. And I feel that yes, it's extremely difficult to even to think about how to convert the paperwork, which was typically done by clinicians, into um, some kind of other forms, which would be electronic records. You know, records which is easy to compile, easy to present. And it's also true not only for public health professionals, it's practically true for everyone who is collecting data. And if you will think about through this level of data collections, um, we might come up with a really very cumbersome system, but extremely important system. I am passionate by data and passionate by uh, analytical might and ability for us to start to think about how that information can be presented and preserved for so many uh, different areas of research. And I see data as sort of like an ecosystem um, modular, where even to ask, by asking a simple question, and let's say this simple question would be, how we can understand famine, how we can understand food crisis. In reality, to ask this type of, type of uh, uh, questions for ourselves, we need to be again, very mindful that this specific process will take many different systems together. In order to answer to that correctly, we need to explore biological systems, social economical system, political system, earth systems, because of they're all somewhat connected to each other. And even if I want to answer on the questions, is it possible to forecast a famine? I have to take every single data source available put them sort of like in a comprehensive and complete way through the data ecosystem uh, construct. So in this case, data collected from multiple entities will end up in different data sources. You know, talking about health records, let's say anthropometric measurements, will be collected on individual level, compiled, combined, curated. Same will happen with information on food and nutrition um, on morbidity and mortality. And this set of information would represent some kind of responses originated and governed by the biological systems. If I will think about famine with respect to major principles of food availability, affordability, and accessibility, again, it should be um, a, 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 an enterprise which will provide me with really very reliable and thoughtful indicators, which will be again possible to interpolate for small populations, groups, families, into our larger groups like communities, towns, districts, but even into bigger community like nations and, and global interconnections across. Every single community can be affected by conflict, civil unrest, food insecurity, and from that regard, I also will be looking for uh, what political systems and their data 
will make it available for the users to reflect it again in a very important granular and time relevant way to the researchers as well. And we know perfectly that none of the food system is intact without thinking about how the meteorological condition, climate condition will impact the food systems as well. And from that point of view, I will be looking through a very large scale monitoring network, which will collect data on meteorology. I will be looking through data sets which are related to uh, remote sensing uh, data sources, and we'll be searching for the climatic indicators. So it means that even in order to answer on seemingly simple question, which is not simple at all, um, the might and the brain and efforts of so many different researchers from so many different fields and so many different practitioners somehow need to be combined, collected, and related to each other. So behind every single point in this data set, it's actually we need to think about that there is a really very important message. So from this, this specific slide, I want to bring to everybody a one single component in mind that behind every single data set, doing every single piece of information, there is a human being. There are somebody who will be collecting data, creating data, and acting upon this data, will be someone whose information is collected, created, and owned. And therefore, if you will think about this very complex relationship, data and ethics are very much intertwined. And if they are so much interlinked with each other, it means that uh, issues which will come to human rights, to privacy, rights to education, rights to freedom will be always there. Think about that it's individual data collect collected on children, it's collected on households, it's information collected in uh, different uh, organizations which donate food or distribute the help. We need to think again from the ethical norms to whom this data belongs, how this data can be shared, and how they can be regulated. So from as a perspective, we can think about data through the longevity of the data set. Those who are taking my course probably saw that this graph multiple times. And let me repeat it again, but probably from a slightly different angle and with a different preamble. I like to think about that the data always need to be originated somewhere. They need to be born. And in order to originate the data, it would be really very important process in terms of thinking about how data will be collected, who will connect them, and what kind of qualities and features need to be embedded. So this data collection scheme would be of high quality, high relevance, highly, um, highly protected, and again, have a longevity for a long way. Why longevity is important? Because of, at every single stage of data validation, data analysis, and data presentation, we wish to have got results from this data. They either need to force us to generate a new set of information or reinforce itself in terms of improving, adapting, and make data more verifiable. So it's again, in data, in a stage of data validation, there are important features like completeness and quality come in place. That's what we are looking for. And with respect to data analysis, we are looking for ways to preserve the complexity of information not oversimplified, but not also dumbed down to the level that it become almost useless. And from this point of view, uh, connections between complexity and ability to explain and inter interpret that information are extremely useful and extremely important. And finally, this data collected for the collection's sake is not really the data we are interested in. We really need to have a structure which allowed us also to share this information to avoid uh, very wide audience. You know, we need to think about how that data is again communicated in comprehensive way and create new solutions, but also ask new questions. So from every single step, we need to think about data integrity and data life cycle. So from 
you know, uh, beginning the probably last century, we start to think about data as an extremely important instrument. This is an instrument for us to reflect reality. And I would like to put another notes on the chat so you can follow my second message for the day. And in this message, we need to think about this type of instruments are created by human. They are created for human. They are created here um, for us to not only reflect the past and the present, but also to guide decisions which might and will affect the future generations. So these instruments are subject to distortion, misconceptions, limitations, because of limitations of our knowledge and limitations of our ability to capture everything. But therefore, they constantly require assessment, oversight, and improvement. And this is second really very important message which I would like to deliver today. That slide is also very familiar for those who took my course multiple times. Um, I, I like to think about that in data analytics, we are like a glue. We are in, in the center of combination of different collaborative schemes uh, when we are combining and exchanging complex data sets. And these data sets can, originate it, can be originated in different disciplines and uh, by different research groups with different ideas in mind, with different agenda, with own vocabulary, with own rules of engagements, with own rule of translations. But how to piece all that pieces together? And this has become extremely challenging because of we need to think about alignment temporal, alignment spatial, alignment logical, conceptual at many different stages. And ability to build that unique vocabulary, which will allow data analysts to work across disciplines would be extremely important. We know that it's already existing challenge and we need to look for potential solutions to overcome these challenges. And while we are talking with each other about the data and data quality, we need to consider that there should be different metrics in terms of data quality in general. And this type of metrics need to be universal. So everyone and every single discipline will be able to identify this type of metrics, uh, create and assess this metrics uh, in effective and efficient way. And this will allow us to create at least the first layer of the joint conversations, like internal interdisciplinary language of research and, and management, which brings me to the, my third message uh, associated with this very important aspects as well. Um, in this third message, I want you to focus on really very important aspects. We like, we like to speak about data being free, data being available, but we also need to think about now for every single discipline, data are monetized. It's like new oil for now. And if it is monetized, we need to think about that the use of data sets should be very carefully regulate, regulated, very thoughtfully regulated. The ownership should be transparent and properly credited at any stage we are working on. And we also need to think about that in every single piece of data collections, there is a labor involved with uh, data preparation, data sharing, data maintenance, data storage. Every single student who was in my class know how long time it takes to take a data set from inceptions and produce the results. It's hours. How those hours are measured, how these hours are compensated. Think about Sasha's example, when you have paper version, electronic version, other type of versions, and when they're not talked to each other. And therefore, these aspects need to be sought very carefully moving forward. Think about that now we are building not the fields of corn, we are building repositories of data, which are taking a lot of energy. Quite often a data center which are collecting this very large, powerful data set for one day taken energy for a village to produce food for a year. And this is really very important aspect I want you to keep in mind. 
Um, so I hope with these three messages, we will be able to move forward and uh, generate new questions. So I'm, now I'm leading the way for Eileen's presentation. Wonderful. And now we'll transition to Eileen. Um, so uh, Dr. Eileen Kendi, who is a former dean and current professor of the Friedman School, um, Dr. Kennedy's research interests include assessing the health, uh, nutrition, diet, and food security impacts of policies and programs, nutrient density and diet diversity, and agriculture and nutrition linkages. She's a member of high-level panel of experts on food security and nutrition of the UN Committee on World Food Security, formerly a member of the UN SCN Advisory Group on Nutrition. She founded and was the first executive director of the USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. She created the Healthy Eating Index, which is used as a single summary to measure diet quality. Uh, so with that, Dr. Kenny, thank you for joining us. Oh, I think you may be muted. I unmute my, there I go. Okay. I thought you had to unmute me. Yep. Thank you, Ryan. So I will not be using slides. I found the first two presentations fascinating, and you may see in a minute why. I'm titling my presentation The Changing Demands for Data, and I'm going to use three examples of this. The first is what I call emerging issues. Uh, this past September, September 2021, the United Nations sponsored a food system summit. And the overall goal of the summit was uh, transformation of food systems. And the summit wanted to discuss bold new solutions to transform food systems. This generated a lot of discussion. And one of the hot topics that emerged is what we call the true cost of food. And I'm gonna, this is a direct quote from a Rockefeller Foundation report, quote, the US food system's current setup has led to costly impacts on health of people, society, and the planet. And the report went on to talk about hidden costs. Um, and in this report, they talk about the United States spends a total of $1.1 trillion on food, but when the impact of food systems on the health, the environment, climate change, loss of biodiversity is counted in, the true cost of food jumps up to 3.2 trillion a year. So three times that headline cost. Now, true cost of food, we really are at the cutting edge of this. To, to wrap your arms around this concept of true cost of food and use it for policy formulation has enormous data requirements that aren't there yet. Uh, we need to identify what metrics to use in calculating true cost of food. How do you quantify these? How do you monetize these factors? And so this is a real growth area in research and, and uh, data requirements that is only beginning to skim the surface. So that was the emerging issue. The second observation I'd like to, to um, highlight is uh, it's more than data. Of course, data are important. No one would argue that. And here I'm gonna use the example of some work I did with FAO back in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we were involved with 24 low and middle income countries, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America. And the, the basic um, goal that we were working towards is how, how do we better achieve sustainable development goal two, which is zero hunger, and also includes eliminating malnutrition in all its forms. Uh, 24 countries came up with their own country reports and the message was clear that lack of quality data to inform policy uh, was important in each of the countries. But, and there is gonna be a but, it was much more than having the data, having statistics. And a term that was used in a number of the reports, country reports was value chain. There was no value chain in data. And by that they meant, uh, no value chain for data generation, um, operating systems for identifying what data are needed, who's to collect them, how data are to be analyzed, where to store them, how to share it, with whom to share, in which form and through, through which channels. And I think this was illustrated both in the Rwanda case and in, in some of Elena's slides. So 
these 24 countries collectively came to the conclusion that there really needed to be a serious investment in institutional and human capacity development um, in order to have a, an appropriate data management uh, critically needed. And I'd like to emphasize critically needed for planning, for monitoring, for evaluation. And this conclusion came not from FAO or not from me, but this conclusion came from the countries themselves. Okay. Now, my third observation, uh, and I know sometimes researchers have a hard time with what I'm going to say because they're in cases where there's so much high quality data, you want to reflect it all. But communication of data, communication of evidence is important. And sometimes less is more. And again, from these 24 countries, I want to use the example of Pakistan. Um, a senior official was able to get to the prime minister of Pakistan with the message that poor nutrition affects children's brains, meaning decreased cognitive capacity. There was a huge report that backstopped that message, but the message that got forward to the prime minister was poor nutrition affects children's brains. Almost immediately, the prime minister realizing the severity of this turned around and made nutrition a priority for Pakistan. That's huge. And so simple message, but of course backstopped by appropriate data. Um, another example I'll end with, I wasn't gonna use it, another example is some of the work I did very early on in my career, where I found very significant effects of the WIC program on decreasing low birth rate, improving diets, improving other health outcomes, which I thought was exciting. But the piece of information that most energized policymakers in Congress was not those data, but the fact that for every dollar you spent on the WIC prenatal component, there were three dollars of healthcare savings. That was the message that somehow uh, had impact and affected legislation. And I'm constantly having to be reminded of that. There are lots of data, but how do we package it in a way that is persuasive to policy officials? And um, persuasive in the sense of having impact. And so I see um, the evolving need for data continuing and we are just beginning some of this journey. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Eileen. Um, so now we'll open up to questions. I know there's been a few in the chat already. Um, so feel free if you'd like unmute and um, welcome to, to share your question. I think John, you had a few questions related to um, who exactly owns these data? How do they actually get the data? Um, and I would love to hear, hear your thoughts if you'd like to ask. You need, you need to unmute, yep. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'm very curious actually, all of my questions have kind of been linked. And it's, um, first of all, where, where do these organizations get the data from about about what the, what the patients or what their population is eating so what what they're eating you know what uh, what nutrient deficiencies do they have you know which food groups they're high in they're low in you know where where do they get this kind of information from and then to what extent is it really specific so are they just covering like kind of like the protein intake or are they also getting into like specific amino acids and vitamins antioxidants and stuff and then also, how are they using this data to, to make decisions? Who do you, Ryan, who do you want to answer that? Whoever, just feel, feel free to jump right in. Okay, John, John the answer to that is good. I'm going to say it depends. It depends on the country. Um, uh, the health data that, that we talked about in Rwanda tends to be um, collected by um, governments, some at the national level, a lot at health center level. For dietary and nutritional data, let me stick with dietary for a moment. Uh, a lot of countries don't collect dietary data. They use their national food balance sheets um, for estimates of um, the FAO term undernourishment. It's, it's very imprecise. Uh, if countries want more information on the kinds of things you're talking about, they would have to, and they do periodic um, either household food consumption surveys, individual food consumption surveys, I've been involved in some in the United States. And I have to say one of my frustrations, and I don't know if this has been talked about, sometimes there, there's much more data collected than is ever analyzed. 
And that, that I think is a travesty. And so I think I speak for the school. Any of our uh, research that's funded by US, federal US government is open access. We share that with anybody. And so we're happy to collaborate, but I think there are a lot of data out there, John, which people may not realize are not that in a real term uh, um, able to be accessed. And some of the things you ticked off like, uh, um, I don't know, omega-3 fatty acids, whatever, is getting really getting into the weeds. And there really are very few ongoing surveys that collect those data, except at the school, there is the Global Dietary Database, which has a lot of this information. I can add to the same logic. I would say similar to food. We produce a lot of food, but we waste a lot of food. Same with data. We produce a lot of data. We don't use that data wisely. We waste this data. Data losing sense and it means they're losing, you know, importance, value, and ability to act on. And it's again because of, you know, again, it's, it's sort of like we're spending a lot of energy on building some capacity. Um, but we are not using that energy right. And that needs to be very carefully re-examined um, and much better understand. Um, because if I saw also comments in terms of minimization, being more, maybe more conscious about how our time and energy of our and our resources are, are going in terms of this data collection. Sometimes we say something like, oh, we have too much of a data. But then another publication will say it's not enough. Mm -hmm. So how to find this right balance? Um, and this type of uh, information is so crucial to understand what is too much, what is not enough, and what exactly needs to be done that the day, the, whatever we collect is just right. Um, I put one link in, in a data uh, in a chat right now. We are working on combining a, free available data into the Atlas system, uh, where you can see information from multiple resources on food patterns, on food productions, dietic, dietetic uh, and, and, and diet patterns across the world. But it's uh, still not clear uh, when it's come to data quality, uh, when it's come to granularity, when it's come to specific allocations, and even more importantly, as Eileen pointed out, who will act on this data and how we will act on them. John, I noticed you raised the issue of privacy and that's absolutely critical. We, we de-identify all of our data um, and uh, lock and key. I mean, but once that is all done, it is accessible to other people, which I think is important because again, I'll repeat, I think we just skim the surface on issues we use uh, in the analysis. And I think there's enormous potential for mining data sets for issues that haven't heretofore uh, been used for. I can add to this as well, um, both on the privacy concerns, but also having too much data. Um, indeed, like patient level data is great, but if you don't identify it, the more of it you have, the more risk there is of breaches and it being exposed um, and all kinds of ethical problems. But also there is um, a, the climate impact of data is also often ignored. Um, it's it costs a lot um, to maintain the servers and it's actually very energy intensive to transmit and to store the data and to run some of these models as well that are um, data mining. Um, so this is also something that's more recently, there are these calculators which you can use um, to calculate your carbon footprint from data use. But up to now it's been um, largely ignored as well. And I actually kind of want to follow up again with you, Sasha, on just ways of improving interoperability between surveillance systems, because one of the other elements that John was asking, um, and, and it came up in the chat, was this notion on how you take data from a variety of different disciplines, pulling them together, um, and especially thinking from both the macro level, the micro level of, of these data, mm -hmm. like, what are different ways that we can improve? I know you talked about different digital technologies, but um, next steps maybe we can take and something came in the chat also asking if uh, your the work you've been doing is open and free data source. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, these are all really good questions. I think interoperability has two um, different angles that that I can think to um, to address. One is just with this explosion of digital technologies, interoperability becomes very difficult to think about because 
every day there are all these new new gadgets that um, ministries of health, governments, um, institutions are being bombarded with, which really makes thinking about their sustainability very difficult because it's almost all the time that you have to consider what's the next next thing and should you abandon what you're doing and then switch to the new system um, and to make, I mean, there are standards that are published like the fire standards um, which encourage interoperability. So now more and more people who are developing software and data products, they're encouraged to comply with um, these standards, which in theory make the data generated from them interoperable, um, but also the systems enable data flow between them, which is really the, the best way um, to make sure that data collected by one entity can even be shared with another, um, another entity. Um, and the same with open and um, open source, a lot of like the, um, all of the software development efforts are encouraged to be um, open source. And certainly the app that we're developing, um, it will be open source and so is DHIS too. Yeah. Wonderful. Further questions in the chat or, or Elena, Eileen, would you either of you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I, it's interesting when I look at sort of um, throughout my career, I was, um, well, I still am, but a lot of the research I've done relies on very quantitative data. But over the years, I've realized the value of qualitative data also. And uh, um, I know sometimes economists, everything has to be quantified, but there, there is a real place in, our, in research and other other areas where qualitative data can be very valuable. So I, I no longer see that as a second class data set. I mean, they're, they could be equally powerful. And I can bring from my experience, uh, the different type of data we also start to bring into fruition, uh, qual qualitative or quantitative data when they are presented with, in the form of dynamic maps, allowed to see drastical changes in time and in space. It's really very hard to capture, you know, 50 maps of data, you know, printed for every single week of the year. And it's extremely difficult to make a judgment based on 50 time series of changes of COVID in every single state. But if you will put them all the pieces together, you will start to see emergent patterns. And that's really very powerful way of presenting information. Now we see that in movies, we see it's in time lapses, we see it's in documentaries. So it's not a, a new idea as a concept, but it's not yet fully embedded and, and employed in public health and the nutrition health arena. But I would say, even with my experience in, in my lifetime, one form of building dynamic map become obsolete as soon as the software is no longer supporting it. It means that Building this type of a tools and capacity, we constantly need to think about its longevity. And if we are not creating the infrastructure to keep it alone, it's really very hard to create a unique piece. And that unique piece is no longer able, you know, but no one will be able to run an own computer with a new software. So thinking about, you know, on a long run, thinking strategically probably will help us to be less wasteful, be more thoughtful, more proactive, and have a much cleaner agenda in terms of understanding what governments needs, what community needs, what individual people and families needs, and think it from you know, a, a more holistic and more you know, future-looking uh, agenda. Fantastic. So with only a few minutes left before the top of the hour, um, as you know, our, the theme of our symposium is to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in nutrition and public health sciences. And so I'm, I'm just wondering from each of you, what are some of the data-related challenges that we face in accomplishing this goal and being able to do research that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion? How about start with including, including uh, the right people? I, I, I'm gonna use an example of maybe 20, 30 years ago where there's some work going on. I, I won't name the university, it's not Tufts, but there was some work going on on heart disease and it only had men participating in the survey work. Well, we know heart disease is a big problem with women that weren't included in the study. So let's make sure we get the right study samples. 
absolutely. Um, you know, I'm very big um, promoter in terms of understanding how the large system uh, operates. And now we are moving toward building sort of more of inclusive um, an exhaustive system which covering population as a whole. It's a wonderful uh, ideas in ideal uh, implementation. However, we perfectly understand that none of the system we are currently building is fully uh, allowed full coverage. Somebody is missing, somebody is omitted. And somebody, what we call a population which are really very hard to reach. And I think that we need to change our strategy uh, very drastically in order not to exclude people who should be examined, evaluated, surveyed, and provided with real help and real solution. We need to change language, how we ask questions. We need to change approaches, how we collect data. And this would require time and very thoughtful approach moving forward. I also believe that in our design, sometimes we are looking for a simplest you know, solution like low hanging fruits. You know, currently see a lot of publications uh, focusing on convenience sample, only for people who can answer on, on a set of surveys which we can implement electronically, but who have access to this type of a technology? Who will be responding? Who have time to respond? It will create again bias samples from a start. And it's extremely difficult to make generalizable and comprehensive conclusions when from a start you are dealing with samples which are covering only a specific fraction of a population. So I think that we again, we need to be, you know, we need to be mindful of what we are doing, how we are doing, what we are achieving. And instead of hiding the truth underneath, basically be honest and um, reveal challenges and difficulties and looking together for proper solutions. Part of that, Elena, though, uh, is we also should be prepared for respondents to be able to say to them why it is important for them to participate in the study. They're not guinea pigs. What's in it for them? And I hate to sound mercenary. I don't mean payment, but why should they participate? Because time is a valuable commodity. Absolutely. And Sasha mentioned about the, you know, who is paying for this data. And we see the challenges as well. And I, I believe that it should be, again, thinking from a uh, completely different perspective. And people are not guinea pigs. That's really, you know, that should be a, a big slogan. Whenever we are collecting data or whenever we are asking people to provide this information, they need to be part of the discussions. They need to voice what is appropriate and what is not. And we really need to understand better the reasons why people refuse to answer a question, mm -hmm. why it is not appropriate for one community to another and be agile, be thoughtful and be conscious. Sasha, any final thoughts? I mean, even from the perspective of designing some of these data systems, um, I think a lot of times like the users are also not included. So just away from the research angle, but the, the data systems angle. And um, a lot of times it's a consultant who comes to design a reporting form. Like I have seen this as well. Some of these reporting forms that the health workers use um, they're designed by a consultant who comes for one week. Um, but the, the challenges that people face on the ground are not reflected. And also on the IT side, um, sometimes the local software developers are not involved. So then if a small change that's locally required needs to be made, sometimes they have to wait for six months until the consultant comes again to make that change. Um, so all of these things create a lot of challenges with sustainability. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. I, I wanna give a special thank you to um, Elena, Eileen and Sasha for joining us today. Um, we have a few sessions coming up, so please do join them at the top of the hour. Um, and with that, thank you all so much uh, for coming today. Thank you, Ryan, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>